it's lovely to see so many people from all around the world here again. Some of those weather reports are making me feel positively warm sat here in a mere minus two. Um, I hope everybody is keeping well in the weather everywhere. Uh, I'm delighted that this lecture will, will be our inaugural and Sutton Memorial Lecture. We're going to try and spend our January Zoom talks thinking about things that were, were close to Anne Sutton's heart and her areas of study and her particular interests over her, her decades of Ricardian study. And doubly delighted that for the, the first of these talks, Livia Visafuchs has agreed to come and speak to us about the vast quantity of work that she and Anne Sutton undertook together. They worked together on numerous publications, lots and lots of research. Uh, and so Livia is going to speak to us today about Anne Sutton, Richard III and Livia. I would remind everyone that if you could keep yourselves muted throughout the talk, please, just to avoid anybody cutting across while Livia's talking. If you have any questions, please feel free to pop those in the chat. If you can put a question mark or a queue at the front of that, it just helps me to spot the questions uh, as I'm, I'm scanning through them. And I'll try and ask Livia as many as we can fit in at the end. As Julia mentioned, this is being recorded for members later. If you don't wish to appear on the recording, please feel free to turn your video off too. If you have any problems with the quality of the stream, it may be worth turning your video off as well, just to improve your bandwidth and to get a, a better signal and enjoy the talk a little bit more. But without any further ado, I will hand you over to the capable hands of Livia to talk about Anne Sutton, Richard III and me. Oh, you're still muted at the moment, Livia, sorry. You're still muted at the moment, Livia. Of course, you didn't. <laughs> yeah, am I there though? Am I audible? Yes, we can hear yes, you. Yes, you are now. Okay. Sorry. Okay. No fingers. Okay. Thanks. Since Anne died, I have, of course, thought a lot about our working together. Why did we work so well together? For Anne, the study of Richard III was almost her whole life. And for me, it was only part of my life, for I had a family to care for and think about. Anne was also much more focused than I. Her power of concentration was phenomenal, even during those last two years when she was really ill. By comparison, I just flipped from one thing to another, gathering information here and there until it all seems to fall into place and can be turned into an acceptable whole. You would not believe the amount of meticulous notes that Anne made over the years and the number of wills that she transcribed in detail and which were no doubt discovered sitting in orderly binders in her cellar after she died. I usually have trouble reading my own notes and I tend to order scans or make photocopies of everything for later use. But in the end, our two methods always seem to come together Mainly, I think, because deep down, we were equally thorough and equally fanatical about getting the end result right by going further, spreading wider and digging deeper than previous commentators had done. At least, I believe so. And there were two of us, of course, with different areas of interest and expertise and different abilities. In 2001, ages ago, at York, I don't even remember the occasion, but I still had a text. We gave a joint paper called The New Richard III, and it amounted to a state of the union of our research on Richard at that point. It was about a man, not his bones yet, and I give you the original text with some changes and some cuts. As Anne once said, even we ourselves often do not know which of us has written a particular sentence. But you will recognize some of Anne's more acerbic statements concerning not always unnamed fools whom she did not suffer gladly or otherwise. Some bits I have removed, to be honest. Much of what I'm going to repeat in this paper will sound very familiar to you and is now common knowledge among Ricardians. But that was not always the case. Some of the oddities and 
fallacies that we try to correct, no doubt, still linger among students of the 15th century. And many of them are probably well worth reminding you of, newer members especially. So much has been found out, we said in 2001. So much has been found out about Richard in the last 15 years as man and as king. And so much more is known about him as a person that we believe we can say with some justification that there is a new Richard III for people to think and write about when compared to the rather dry and empty ghost, usually malignant, even morbid, that 20th century scholarship has promoted. We think this change has been achieved in two ways. First, by digging over new ground and finding new facts, however small. Secondly, by cleaning up some of the facts that have long been known, but have been, become encrusted with layers of error and prejudice. As far as new facts are concerned, more is known today about Richard's childhood, youth, intellectual and military interests, his faith, his attitude to war and peace, and his own kingship than 15 years ago. These new facts can be presented simply because they have not yet been confused and obscured. Secondly, there is Richard, the most mythologized king of England. We are not referring to the growth of myths about him, such as his deformity and the endless succession of murders. It is the more subtle, the smaller myth, which needed to be scraped clean and their origins reconsidered. Original evidence and uncomplicated facts, which should have presented no problem and have often been obscured by the misguided efforts of antiquarians, historians, and popular writers who were careless or lazy. We will rehearse for you some of the new facts, plainly and briefly, and deal with some of the old ones in more detail. The cleaning process is always laborious and complicated. The correction of errors is far more difficult and time consuming than the presentation of new information. First and foremost, there is the hypocrisy theory as applied to Richard's character. This pervades almost everything that scholars have said about him for centuries. It was created by Polydor Virgil when faced with the stories of Richard as a good man and king and as a monster. Virgil was steeped in ancient history and had plenty of classical models to help him create an image of public virtue and private villainy. He probably never had any doubts because his Greeks and Roman authorities were impeccable. And the convenience of such a two-faced picture that explained everything was evident. 500 years later, Virgil's point of view appealed strongly to Charles Ross, for his biography of Richard III. He set out to examine the validity of Virgil's simple explanation of Richard's good government. Richard found that the murder of his nephews made him unpopular and this made him fearful and so anxious to appease God and his human critics that he took up a new form of life in order to be thought righteous, liberal. He became suddenly good. Ross inclined to see hypocrisy in his attitude over the execution of Clarence and Richard's sympathy to the Earl of Desmond concerning his suffering at the hands of Queen Elizabeth Woodville is called tongue-in-cheek. Richard's piety was genuine, but his sexual virtue hypocritical. And the incident which proved the validity of the hypocrisy theory was the rumour of Richard's proposed marriage to his niece and his denial of it. The rest seemed obvious. The usurpation made Richard desperate to commend himself, particularly by his administration of justice and his pardon. Thus, Rouse espoused the theory of hypocrisy and adopted Virgil as the true revelation of the usurper, and he was followed by others. To reject the hypocrisy theory does not widen our understanding of Richard. There is no new Richard about this but it does clear the way for a fair judgment on any new facts that have been and may yet be found. And it dis does give us a first warning not to repeat the words of others, except with great care. On a personal note, in uh, 2024, 
I have to admit that I gave up reading biographies of Richard some years ago, so I cannot claim to know whether the hypocrisy theory is still flourishing in places. But I do know that Anne felt very strongly about its use. So, back to 2001. Where does one turn for anything new? A line of research that we fell upon was Richard's books. To be fair, it was Anne who fell upon it. I was very new to the Ricardian game at the time. At first, it was just curiosity as to what these books were. Well, then we realized that their texts their text together was a, were a remarkable collection covering most medieval themes and knowledge, barring the professional subjects of medicine, law, and theology. Even more striking was the fact that Richard, both as Duke and as King, put his name in his books. And this is really significant because it was not as common a practice in his day as you might think. Could one therefore deduce anything about his character from them, or at least cull a few facts from his ownership and learn something about the habits of thought of his times? Some commentators, those that had remembered to consider the books at all, had merely concluded that there were very few, that they were mainly religious and mainly in English. The real picture is very different. Richard owned 18 texts which survived, and we know he owned at least another four which do not. If there is a bias in this collection, it's towards history. Only four were religious, the life of St. Catherine, his Book of Hours, a collection of Old Testament stories in verse, and the work of St. Magdild of Hackeborn. He had no preference for manuscript over print, did not demand that all his books were sumptuously decorated or even new. It is a quirk of survival that Richard owned one of the two surviving copies of the English translation of Mechtild of Hackeborn's Book of Special Grace. He had the only extant copy of a prose translation of the Romance of Hippomedon, and the only manuscript copy of Geoffrey of Monmouth's Historia Regum Britanniae to have belonged to a medieval king of England. And he had one of the two surviving texts of the prophecy of the eagle with a particular commentary. Finally, Caxton, Caxton dedicated one book to Richard, Ramon Lull's Order of Chivalry, and most important, books and their makers were specifically exempted when Richard's parliament took measures to control alien workers and their goods in England. The contents of Richard's books helped to fill in the background behind his choice of motto, loyalty binds me, and the meaning of the crucial word loyalty. Strictly speaking, loyalty in the Middle Ages did not mean just one man maintaining his allegiance to another, but rather behaving to all others as one should, equals, inferiors, and superiors. A loyal knight should be true to his lord and his friends, and protect his dependents. A citizen should be loyal to his fellow citizens and to those who ruled him. It applied to all classes of people, from the marketplace up. According to some philosophers, loyalty was the same as justice, in the sense of doing what the law commands. To Dante, loyalty was the foremost virtue of an adult man in his prime, and one of its greatest exponents had been Aeneas, the founder of Rome. In the 13th century, Giles of Rome's famous study of how princes and other men should live, of which Richard owned a copy, loyalty was virtue entire, every virtue in one. And in Langland's Piers Plowman, another book that Richard probably owned, loyalty also means justice in the sense of living righteously, and it applied to all conditions of men. It is unlikely that Richard was always or completely aware of all these variations and shades of meaning, but his book collection shows that he could have known them. And it is possible that he saw his obligations as king and ruler in this light, obeying the law and protecting his people. It is conceivable, at least, that he saw his taking of the crown and deposing his underage nephews as serving his country and the common good, considering its welfare above anything else. 
Also revealed by a closer study of Richard's books were some more tangible, tangible facts about his religious life, particularly the meaning of his prayer. Much had been written on these two topics. Most of it without any attempt to understand the true nature of 15th century religious mores or any form of genuine faith. For example, Richard's piety had been called the rather morbid piety of the late 15th century. The hypocrisy theme was also called in again. Everything Richard said or did was an attempt to expiate his sins, including, of course, owning the prayer that we have called the prayer of Richard III. It became clear in the course of our studies that this long prayer, once thought so special and so revealing, can be found in the books of hours of dozens of people all over Europe. All these owners and users of the prayer were no greater sinners, as far as we know, than you or I. But in Richard's case, inevitably, the inclusion of this prayer was a sign of disturbed emotional condition or an attitude of mind bordering that more than bordering upon persecution. The manuscript of Richard's Book of Hours, which contains the prayer, created great technical problems for some scholars. The problems are simply caused by the book's physical, physical state, and a closer look could have solved the mystery. In the manuscript, one folio happens to be missing. And this gap in the text happens to have connected the introduction of one prayer, of which the main text was on the lost page, to the main text of another prayer, of which the introduction was on the missing page. So the introduction of one prayer became, as it were, the title of another prayer. It was, to put it crudely, just Richard's luck that the surviving introduction to the missing text appeared to prove that the surviving prayer linked to his name had been won to St. Julian, the saint, the saint who had killed his father and his mother. Common sense should have made anyone realize that there was no saint whose intercession would benefit a parasite or any other kind of homicide. Christian religion obviously does not allow for that. A little research reveals that St. Julian was worshipped in the Middle Ages for the humble life he led after his crime, serving wayfarers as ferrymen, taking them across the river without payment. This made him the protector of travellers. The missing prayer to St. Julian, which can be identified by the part of its introduction that survived, was meant to be said in the morning when setting out. It asked for a safe journey, good shelter for the night, a pleasant host, and finally a safe homecoming. The prayer is quite short and had been on the folio that was torn out. The other side of that folio had been blank originally, and that was where the introduction and part of the prayer of Richard III were inserted for the king into an existing book. New pages were also added to make room for the rest of that long prayer. We know what kind of introduction that prayer of Richard III probably had. It explained the help and comfort that saying the prayer would give, anyone, would give to anyone in great distress. A contemporary, a contemporary copy in the Book of Hours of Another Prince reads, Whoever is in distress, anxiety or infirmity, or has incurred the, incurred the wrath of God, let him say this prayer on 30 successive days but he must be without mortal sin. It is certain that the Lord God will hear him completely and that all his trouble will turn to joy and comfort, whether he says it for himself or for others. This introduction is likely to have contained some reference to St. Augustine, who, it is claimed, composed the text. And there may have been mention of papal indulgences that could be earned by saying the prayer. This bit of popery made some later Protestant owner of the book tear out the offending page. And as a consequence, he or she left Richard to the mercy of historians, not prepared to look a little further. About Richard's life, we also found some new facts. The first to be discussed is another example of the troubles caused by copying others instead of looking at the sources oneself and above all, understanding them in context. 
This tendency for careless error starts with Richard's infancy, with that often repeated phrase that you all know, Richard liveth yet. It comes from a good source, a poem describing the descent of the House of Clare from Edward I down and concluding with the children of Richard and Cecily, Duke and Duchess of York. The text is in verse and the manuscript is now known as the Clare Roll. It was written in the late 1450s at the House of Austin Friars at Clare, Suffolk. The author was almost certainly Osborne Bockenham, well known for writing Lives of Saints and other texts for literary patrons in Norfolk and Suffolk, among them the Duke of York himself. The text is written in two parallel columns. One has the Latin text, the other the English translation. Both contain the same information. To take the few lines that concern us, the Latin is straightforward, listing the younger children of Richard of York. Translated, it reads, Then George is born, and Thomas, and Richard. Thomas departed this life by a happy fate. When Bockham ren rendered this into English, however, he had to add words in order to make his verse read correctly. So we have, George was next, and after Thomas born was, which soon after did pace by the path of death into the heavenly place. Richard liveth yet, but the last of all was Ursula, to him whom God list call. It is no great piece of poetry, but it repeats the Latin and merely means Richard, like George, was alive, but Thomas was not, and Ursula, the last child, also died. The friar used exactly the same phrase, liveth yet, liveth yet, of Richard's father, the Duke of York, son lines back in the translation. Both father and son were still alive when the friar wrote. Nothing is said about their state of their health, about the state of their health. It was probably Buckingham's English phrase, which suggested to Sharon Turner, author of A Popular History of England, in the early 19th century, that Richard was a sickly child. Turner was by no means unfavorable to Richard, but inclined to overcolor his material. And the phrase live as yet seemed to confirm the innuendo of John Rouse about Richard's strange birth and feeble body. Caroline Halstead and James Gardner in their biographies of Richard both showed that they knew the text, but failed apparently to look at the Latin. Gardner was happy to follow Rouse and he imitated Turner's assumption that Richard was a sickly child. Historians, popular or academic, have refrained from using the Clairo itself, and they never thought to look again at the original text, which had been in print for a long time. Even the legend of St. Anthony and his boar has been pressed into service by writers in search of color. A side shoot of the St. Anthony story is the habit of calling the runt of the litter the Tantony pig. And of course, the runt of the York litter was Richard, hence his choice of the boar as his emblem, etc., etc. It all appeared to fit, but in fact, there is not the slightest evidence for any of this. As regards Richard's youth, we have gained some new information over the years, small facts which fill in the existing picture. Richard's early years were, of course, overshadowed by the defeats and victories of his father and brother. The most traumatic events must have been the two occasions on which he had to go into exile in the Low Countries, first as a child and next as a young man. On the first occasion, he, with his brother George, were just pawns in the diplomatic game of anglo burgundian relations. Philip the Good of Burgundy kept the two young refugees in the antechamber of his dominions, that is to say, the town of Utrecht, ruled by Philip's son, Bishop David, in whose palace they no doubt stayed. After a couple of months, their diplomatic value had increased dramatically by their brother Edward's accession on the 4th of March in 1461. Before the 9th of March, the news arrived in Utrecht and the town and council immediately started to treat the boys like important visitors. The gift of wine they received, the equivalent of 655 bottles of today, when compared to other such gifts to visiting dignitaries, is large and clearly reflects the boys' new status. 
Years later, when the merchant community of Utrecht needed English help, they and Bishop David himself wrote several letters to the Dukes of Clarence and Gloucester, reminding them of the honor that had been paid to them in their hour of need. When the news of Towton became known, George and Richard and their 23 companions were invited by Duke Philip to come to his court at Bruges. Harwood, the children of York, stayed at the Teste d'Or in Sluis, and once in Bruges, they were feasted again in the company of, company of the ladies and gentlemen of the town, many members of the court and the Duke himself, by, before they travelled on to Calais and England. At Canterbury, they were received by the prior and convent of Christchurch and attended Vespers High Mass and Vespers again over two days. They had to sit through another feast, which included two oxen, 20 sheep and three gallons of wine. When approaching London, they were met by the mayor and aldermen and wardens of the city companies in their liveries, and they would have met the new King Edward after the 12th of June when he arrived at his palace of Sheen. All such details of the exile and return are minor ones, but they increase our knowledge, especially of the ceremonies that governed Richard's life, even as a child. Richard's second exile was rather different. At this time, he played a more active role than has been assumed. We now know that he did not take ship with his brother at Bishop's Lynn in early October 1470. But they must have separated. Perhaps Richard just missed the boat and traveled north to find safety. But if we can believe continental sources, he used his time well and gathered many men for his brother before crossing over to Zealand himself early in November. He was a refugee and had to borrow money to be able to continue his journey and join Edward and the others at The Hague. Around Christmas, they all traveled south to Bruges. At uh, this point, I would like to add a little excursion of something I discovered myself since. I would like to think that Richard was with Edward when the king visited the town of Lille in early 1471. And that on that occasion, they met, small world, Jean de Vavrin, my Jean de Vavrin, the historian of England, who was one of the notables of the town. Friday the 11th of January, accompanied by his host, Louis de Bruges, Lord of Rutuse, Edward arrived in Lille, where he stayed at the inn called Le Chevalet d'Or, on the Rue de la Grande Chaussée. The cellar of this building still exists, as does, of course, the street. The Gra Rue de la Grande Chaussée was around the corner, literally, from Bavrin's townhouse in the Rue Basse. Encouraged by Duke Charles and Ruthuse, the government of the town came in great numbers to welcome the king and do him honor. The duke had ordered the expenses of the king and his companions, 60 pounds, to be paid by the town, and a further 51 shillings were spent on food and drink enjoyed during the reception. Jean de Vavrin was no doubt one of the company. He is the only author to record Edward's visit to Lille. And it is fascinating, at least to me, to Im imagine this civic reception, which in its social interaction and its eats and drinks, no doubt much resembled similar gatherings of today. On Sunday, the 13th of January, the king left for Bruges and the hospitality of Louis of Rutus's own townhouse. A month later, Richard of Gloucester rode from Bruges to Lille again to visit his sister, before traveling north with her as far as Ghent but nothing else is known about this visit. It has been suggested over the years ad nauseum that the English exiles experienced a culture shock in the sophisticated surroundings of the Burgundian court, and that Edward was struck with a sudden desire to own the same books as his host, Louis of Rutuse. Our view has always been that there was nothing new or unexpected in the material splendor and magnificent ceremonial of the Duke's court, and that most of it felt just like home. Every kind of luxury that was available in the wealthy low countries and of interest to the English court had already been exported and was enjoyed in, enjoyed in England. We cannot not mention Richard's attitude to chivalry and war. A few myths have been dispelled and some new information uncovered in the last few decades. 
As we all know, at the battles of Barnet and Tewkesbury, Richard had his first experience of actual combat. And it's likely that he was in the thick of the fighting as he was rather badly wounded at Barnet. This fits with the old and still very much current view of Richard as a bonnie fighter or warmonger, depending on your point of view. But how true is this warlike picture of Richard throughout his life? We have argued that Richard, like Edward, was rather more of a soldier and knight errant before he became king than after he had taken on the responsibilities of kingship. Edward, of course, had to fight for his crown and went through every possible adventure that chivalry could require of a man. And so in his brother's service had Richard. Both Edward and Richard knew all about chivalry. They had the right books, they were given the right examples and received the right training. There is little doubt that in the eyes of their contemporaries, they were perfect knights. In France in 1475, Richard apparently objected to his brother making peace with France without a blow being struck. But he did not stay away like a sulking schoolboy, as has been implied. In fact, he did what one could expect from a commander having a few hours of free time while negotiations with the enemy were underway. He went to have a look at the opposing army. The Admiral of France showed off the army of the King of France, which was drawn up in the field to the Duke of Gloucester and other lords. And the Admiral, in his turn, visited the English army. A different slant must also be given to the story that the King of France was able to bribe a warmongering and fickle Duke of Gloucester into compliance with gifts of horses and costly tableware, as many commentators since Philippe de Comines have been trying to tell us. The fact is that Richard and George of Clarence, who had not, Clarence of course had not objected to the peace, went to visit Louis XI together. A German eyewitness recorded that on Thursday, the 31st of August, the two brothers of the King of England came to Amiens. The one is Duke of Clarence and the other Duke of Gloucester, and they dined with the King in the morning. Their visit was in fact no more than a polite gesture and part of the general comings and goings at Amiens shortly before the English left for home the same day. It is true, no doubt, that Louis's other known gift to Richard in 1480, nothing less than an enormous field gun, a great bombard, was meant to persuade the King of England's brother to help smooth the way for an improvement of Anglo-French relations. In Richard's letter of thanks, we are fortunate to have his own words describing why he particularly appreciated the gift. I have always taken and still take great pleasure in artillery, and I assure you it will be a special treasure to me. When they each became king, however, both Edward and Richard necessarily and sensibly took another stance. Peace became their objective. The peace negotiations with Scotland in the summer of 84 and the opening speech made by the Scottish ambassador, William Whitelaw, gives us several glimpses of how the speaker hoped to touch the King of England's mind and heart. Whitelaw listed Richard's general virtues, his humanity, courtesy, liberality, justice, his greatness of heart and his wisdom that made him kind to everybody, individually and collectively. In other words, his loyalty. I'm reading this because I like this. Then he praised his military virtues, experience, courage, good fortune and authority, and managed at the same time to link Richard to one of the great heroes of Greek mythology, Tydeus, the bravest warrior at the siege of Thebes, and famous for his small stature, indomitable courage, and as Whitelaw must have realized perfectly well, his emblem of the boar, Whitelaw promised permanence and glory to Richard's reputation, using a pleasant pastoral quotation from Virgil, which had the boar peacefully roaming the mountains. And so he came gracefully to the subject of peace and the purpose of the conference. Whitelaw stressed dramatically how Richard had chosen a time of peace, how, sorry, not how Richard, how Christ had chosen a time of peace to come into the world and be made man how the Romans had built a temple to peace and loyalty, 
how Christ had called those who make peace the sons of God, etc. He described the horrors and folly of war and the blessings of peace. Finally, Whitelaw said, it was unnatural for English and Scots to be at war, for they were subject to the influence of the same sky and land, and they resembled each other in body, language, and complexion. Whitelaw's flattery eased the formal opening of negotiations before the enthroned king, and the desire for peace of all negotiators brought the conference to a satisfactory conclusion, eventually. It has been suggested that Richard saw the truth made at Nottingham as part of his larger program for the peaceful government of the North. The new Richard III pays more attention to peace. Now to pass to more frivolous matters. There is another myth which appears to reflect on Richard's morals and lifestyle, as if it was a fop or a dandy. Sharon Turner, perhaps inspired by Shakespeare, is the main architect of this story. We all know Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's image of Richard after his successful wooing of the Lady Anne, he, calling on the sun to stay out so he could admire his shadow and declaring he would go and order new clothes from his tailor. In 1768, Horace Walpole drew attention to the surviving great wardrobe accounts of Richard III, mostly devoted to the expenses of his coronation. Historians were suddenly confronted with the sumptuous materials and robes worn by a 15th century king. They should have taken it in their stride, as sumptuous clothes were worn by kings and queens of England within their living memory. The innocent, innocent wardrobe accounts provided subtle information, a confirmation of the image created by David Garrick's or Edmund Keane's Richard III. Sharon Turner also used extracts from Richard's signet office book, Harley 433, including the requisition of banners, badges, and clothes needed for the creation of his son as Prince of Wales in York. The documents had, of course, been drawn up by the officers of the Great Wardrobe for their own record. But Turner imagined Richard himself drawing up the detailed list of goods and assumed a solicitude for his personal exhibition, which we should rather look for from the fop. When he used the great wardrobe accounts to describe the coronation, Turner found a reference to the Duke of Buckingham's gown, and he imagined jealousy between the two. He continued, the king's splendor necessarily outshone the Duke of Buckingham's, the ducal fop was transcended by the royal coxcomb. Richard enjoyed his own pomp with too much complacency to think of the duke's feelings. Not understanding the norms of a medieval court and its splendors, Turner also guessed that such extravagance contributed to Richard's unpopularity at large and with Buckingham in particular. In 1830, Sir Nicholas Harris Nicholas published the wardrobe accounts of Edward IV and tried to put some of the records straight. He recognized that the accounts were not unusual in any way. He took Turner to task for ascribing to Richard a love of splendid clothes and a taste for pomp, which in fact belonged to the age and not to the individual. He quoted Turner in detail to show his mistaken estimate of the evidence. And he says something that you can hang above your bed if you're doing research. The mistaken estimate of the evidence, they prove the necessity of an historian not merely using research, of be, but being of being able to attach a proper value to his materials. Nicholas also said, there is not a single circumstance connected with Richard, which justifies the opinion, opinion that he was more fond of splendor and parade than his predecessors much less that he was either a fop or a fox school. His statements went unheeded because the idea of Richard as a fop was far too attractive. Writers of popular histories of dress remain delighted with the foppish Richard, and he can be found in Fairhold's costume in England and Mrs. Ashdown's British costume and others, all assiduous copyists and none of them original researchers. Their works went through several editions and became influential. 
The legend was giving another airing as late as 1981, when a biography of Richard was still happy to assert that his con coronation contained deliberately elaborate and expensive ceremonies, and that the wardrobe accounts may reveal a personal proclivity for finery. Now we come to the decoration that I've hung up behind me and which I hope is, is visible to you. I mean, it's a bit small for myself, but it is relevant to my talk. It's not usually there. One of the two writers who most eagerly adopted the fop myth also repeated another myth associated with Richard's appearance. This time his supposed portrait, his supposed portrait, In the presentation scene of Edward IV's copy of Jean de Wavre's collection of Chronicles of England. You have Edward IV, Jean de Wavre, Richard, and miscellaneous courtiers. This story had been started in 1773 by the young engraver Thomas Strutt, who illustrated his regal and ecclesiastical antiquities with images of the kings and queens of England taken from manuscripts, including Edward IV's books at the British Museum. Strutt assumed that the presentation scene in the first volume included portraits of Edward IV, the kneeling author, Vavrin, and other coaches, though in fact they're all standard artist figures used in the Low Countries and elsewhere and have no relationship to Edward IV and his court. Strutt guessed that the man in the short doublet in the foreground was Richard of Gloucester, but he was careful to say probably when he identified Richard. Anne and I have pursued this image of the man with the protruding buttocks over the generations, and we found that he had an earlier life, before Richard, on a playing card. Playing cards were very often used by illuminators as models. And that he is the original of the knave of cards. You just have to look at some knave of cards when they have a full length figure and it looks very much like that. After Richard's time, he appeared as the third of the three kings, as well as many other characters. And a drawing remarkably similar to the painting in Edward IV's book has even been attributed to Bellini. All of which proves once more that artists copy each other as assiduously as do historians. Fairholt used Strutt's engraving of these figures for his own book, and he commented, The Duke of Gloucester is in the most fashionable dress of the day. His hat has a gold band and a jeweled button to secure the stem of a feather, which bends gracefully over the head. His crimson jacket is exceedingly short, the sleeves being exceedingly long. He wears the garter, and you can't see that because his legs go. He has the fashionable long He has the fashionable long pointed shoe and clog or pattern. The face certainly resembles that of Richard III in the rooms of the Society of Antiquaries. But this, of course, is the younger man. His dandyism is also an historic fact. The identification has been endlessly repeated since by, since by a long line of authors down to this day. The oddity of comparing this incredibly ugly face in the miniature to any of the surviving portraits of Richard III seemed to have passed most people by. And one has to take only one objective look at all the men in this presentation scene to realize that they are the product of an artist who was no good at human faces even though the landscapes he painted in the same volume are amazingly beautiful. It may not come as a surprise that one of the artists belonging to this same group of illuminators is called by art historians le maître au tête trivial, the master of the trivial heads. I have since done uh, my personal uh, research, I've did, since done more research on this manuscript and this image, and I can assure you there is no way in which any of these faces are true to life. The image was painted for a manuscript that Charles the Bold of Burgundy presented to Edward IV at the start of the King's French campaign in 1475, and the artist knew nothing about Edward or his court, except that they wore garters, as his own duke did 
and thus and those garters he carefully added. Let us finally return to the realm of the real and new Richard III. In the spring of 1484 in York, Richard welcomed, welcomed the Silesian traveller Niklaus von Poplar, who was pleased and conceited enough to write down almost exactly what the king said and did. According to Poplar, Richard expressed admiration at his guest's mastery of the Latin tongue. He described the magnificent surroundings in which the king took his meal, but also his graciousness to his guests and their conversation, which was wide ranging from the Latin origin of the name of Pontefract to the, to the exact date of the annual ceremony of feet washing on Monday, Thursday. One of the most important remarks of Richard himself concerned, as you all know, the Crusades. The king had asked von Poplar about many continental princes and their affairs, and finally about the Turks. Having been told how the king of Hungary had recently gained a great victory over them, Richard enviously exclaimed, I would like my kingdom and land to lie where the land and kingdom of the King of Hungary lies, on the Turkish frontier itself. And he continued with youthful enthusiasm, then I would certainly, with my own people alone, without the help of other kings, princes or lords, completely drive away not only the Turks, but all my enemies and opponents. Richard was displaying his confidence in his own military abilities, but also refer referring to the international political situation and the hopelessness of ever forging an alliance between the princes of Western Europe and organize a joint campaign against the Turks. We learn more about Richard from von Poplau's report when he describes the polite combat de générosité that they had over the king's gift to him of 50 nobles. I begged his majesty not to give such a gift to an undeserving person, because I had come to his majesty not for gifts, but to obtain his grace. The king answered that if, for the sake of my honor, I refused his gift, which concerned his honor, how did I think to obtain his grace? And he became quite angry and asked me whether I was of royal or princely blood, that I looked down on his gift. Whether Richard was really incensed or merely pretending, von Poplau finally took the money and departed highly pleased. The general impression of Richard that we get from von Poplau's account is that of a magnificent and thoughtful prince, um, a good host who took a great interest in many diverse matters. So much for the new Richard at the beginning of this century. A lot has happened since. Anne, who was always far more Ricardian than I, has continued her research on Richard and written on his relationship with Ireland and with his towns, on his defense of the North and on many of his contemporaries. Together we have worked on a number of other 15th century matters, and I myself have slowly turned back to the continent and the Burgundian lands, but the links with England remain important. My latest research concerns the anglo burgundian tournament at Smithfield in 1467, for which many fascinating documents survive in several languages, turning it into a vast, complicated and very satisfying project. And of course, those poor bones were found, and apart from a lot of emotional fallout, provided us with some information about the king's physique and his last hours. Unfortunately, they also confirmed one of the myths that were told about Richard III. There was something the matter with his back. Let us hope this will not encourage those willing to find fault with him to say, oh well, if that is correct, perhaps the other accusations are also justified. No smoke without fire, and all the rest of the cliches that people fall back on. Let us hope that we all can all continue to do our research and add more fragments to the true picture, because we enjoy it and it gives pleasure to ourselves and to others. And let us do so without prejudice and without pink glasses. Thank you. Thank you very much, Livia. That was wonderful. Um, amazing to hear how much of that stuff has been uh, sort of known for 20 years but people yeah. still repeat it i still hear some of those very arguments that you and anna shooting down there 20 years ago i still hear them bandied around today 
Um, so thank you very much for sharing that with us. Uh, we have got a few questions in the chat. Um, the first couple of questions are around um, where Richard's books are currently deposited and whether there is a list of those books anywhere. I'm going to kind of preempt your answer by... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Can I add to that that writing on the back of Philippa Langley's book, the same publisher is now... Uh, uh, publishing uh, an ebook and a paperback of written search books. Yes, so, that'll be something to look at. There is a full catalogue. There is a, a whole chapter. Right, 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 okay, right, right. A full so catalogue. I'm not going to answer the question. You just have to read it up. <laughs> so, the, yeah, they, they do exist. Uh, if you can get a copy of Richard III's books, I thoroughly recommend it. Anyway, they're, they're all online as well. I mean, the, the, the basic information is online in the Ricardian online. Wonderful. Uh, we have another question. Um, what is the evidence for Richard being injured at Barnet? And do we know what kind of injury it was? No. Uh, yeah, I think I don't quite remember. Forgive me. But there is this German account of the Battle of Barnet, which says that he was got gewonded, which means well wounded. And that does not mean, according to me, uh, slightly wounded. It means rather badly wounded, like saying, oh, gosh, yeah, he's dead. OK. Something like that, you know, it, 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 and it, I think it was in his arm. I think it actually says that too. Yeah, uh, Again, Gerhard von Wessel, isn't it? Sends a newsletter to the continent yeah, in which he talks yeah, about yeah, Anthony yeah. Woodville, yeah, Anthony, yeah. Anthony Woodville and Richard both being injured at Barnet. Yeah. Um, and that perhaps Anthony Woodville's injury is the reason that he remains in London. But Richard seems to have recovered enough to make it to Tewkesbury. So, but we're not quite clear what the actual injury was. <laughs> yeah, well, Anthony Woodville is another story. Yeah. <laughs> um, do we know if Richard was offered and refused a pension by Louis XI in 1475? I can't remember. I just, I can't answer that properly because I'm not sure. Of course, it was so common to get a pension from a foreign prince that you shouldn't put too much into it, even if he did. I mean, I mean, Hastings got one and Woodville got one and yeah, the, and, and they all got money from the Duke of Burgundy as well, as far as I remember. I can't answer it with any exactness, no. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think Richard didn't accept a pension from Louis. I think we're possibly less clear on whether he was offered one. I, I'd imagine he probably yeah. was because everybody else was offered one. Yeah, but I, I just don't know. I can't say for sure. Yeah. yeah. But the um, bomb is amazing. I mean, the bombard is really amazing. That you get sent to bombard by, by the King of France is, is well. I mean, and that and that Richard, well, like any young man, of course, like any young soldier, he liked it. Yeah, yeah. quite understandable. Louis Louis very clearly knew what he was doing. Yeah, he usually did. Yeah. Uh, another question: Why do you think that the dress habits that seem so common and were shared by many and were in line with the styles of the time are? particularly held out in Richard's term as showing him as a bad person. If he was just doing and wearing what everybody else was doing and wearing, why do we see him portrayed as bad for doing it? Well, that's, yeah, that's just the prejudice that people sometimes had and still have, presumably. I mean, of course, you can, you can say lots of things about Richard that are not nice and maybe true, but in this case, it's total nonsense. I mean, he was just the same as all the others. Yeah. Well, of his class, of course, but still. Um, can you recommend a couple of good books to better understand the Burgundians? Oh, right. Yeah, well, there's always, there's still Richard Vaughan studies of all the four dukes. And, and this, yes, I suppose this book by Bart van Loo, which I haven't read, um, may be absolutely fine. I mean, a little more popular than Vaughan, of course, who is very detailed. And there, there are new editions of Vaughan with new introductions with, with, with more recent literature and all that. Yeah, I, I've actually got a copy of Bart Van Loo's book, but I haven't read it either yet, so I no, can't. It's the awful. Problem is, the problem is it, 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 he has now written a book <laughs> about Napoleon. Do yes, it's awful. More? it's awful. It's awful. It's <laughs> awful. Well, I believe you. I haven't read it. I'm not going to read it, but I'm don't don't waste, yeah, okay. don't waste your time. Don't waste your time reading it. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad I, I didn't I didn't respond when I was asked to review it because I couldn't. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, and of course, there's still Hausiga. There's still Hausiga in 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 a now very good new English translation, and he is still fascinating. Whatever you say, and he knows his stuff. 
and he quotes his stuff and it's just still marvelous yeah uh, i think the last question at the moment uh, is from susan troxell who says brilliant talk and she just wanted to say how much your work with Anne sutton has educated her as a, a novice and amateur historical researcher so thank you for all of that work um, and a couple of questions from susan uh, we've recently seen documents emerge from archives on the continent about the missing princes which suggests there's still plenty of work to do do you see areas that call out for further research or reassessment of primary sources oh i think the the, the gelder's document is an amazing find but it doesn't mean it's the top of an iceberg if you see what i mean i don't think it is and of course the Lille archives are inexhaustible you could spend the rest of your life uh, sitting there and, and, and going through them. And you might find something. But on the other hand, the document that I have found at Lille, I think is relatively meaningless. You could find many more like that and they would all say the same thing and it wouldn't prove anything. But I, I well, lots of people have studied from Huizinga onwards, Dutch sources on Richard and Edwards. And yeah, well, you, you, well, you can never say ne never, of course. But yeah. I don't feel that is some hidden cache with us we should all uh, go for. But of course, I'm slightly contradicted by this find in the in the Gelders archive. Yeah, it's exciting to think that there might be something out there somewhere, yep. tracking yep. it down, as you say, amongst the, the mass of archives that are out yep. there, finding those yep. things is very much a needle in a haystack time. Yeah, yeah, it is particularly Lille is, is well, both the, the National Archives and the Municipal Archives, they're enormous. I've never actually attempted it unless I had a lead to find a document. I mean, just go through the documents, it's just, I mean, if you want to write anything else in this life, you can't do that. <laughs> Uh, and Susan's second question was, um, Anne's last published work was her Yorkist defence of the North. Did she leave any unfinished manuscripts on the subject or, or the defence of anywhere else or any other topic? I don't know, um, because I haven't been there. I haven't been to England for years and I certainly haven't been to Anne. Um, Christian Steer might know, but I don't think so. She was planning a second volume of this, this book on the, on the, on the defence. But how far she'd gone, I don't know. I mean, the fact that she finished it was a miracle anyway. I mean, she was so ill and she just kept going. Well, I knew from experience that, 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 that she was less ill when she was working because in the past, when she had a headache, you just had to start talking about the 15th century subject and hey, bingo, the headache was gone. I mean, that's, that's how she, she, she uh, uh, lived. Yeah, I, I always find my wife is the opposite. If I start talking about the 15th century, she develops a headache. Yeah, but that's other people, isn't it? That's <laughs> not, not the Cardians or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, I think that's all of the questions that we've got, Livia. We've got a whole long list of comments from people saying how much they've enjoyed that. They're really grateful to have heard all of your experience and to hear that talk and that insight. Everybody's really, really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's very odd to talk to yourself. <laughs> 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 Yeah, it's very strange. Was the, was the picture really visible or should I hold it up again or something, the, 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 the hanging behind me? I, I can make it out behind you. I could see the figures that you were pointing to. Right, because I, I think it's somewhere on the, on the website, isn't it, anyway? So you can always check it there. Yeah, yeah, but I think it's available is, online. It, it's an amazing picture, total load of nonsense, but it is an amazing picture. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing all of that with us, Livia. Um, we've, we've really enjoyed it and everybody's really appreciated it. Uh, thank you to everybody who has come out or stayed in rather at least on a cold day it seems almost everywhere uh, it's been wonderful to to share an hour of your company i look forward to seeing everybody again hopefully at next month's zoom talk uh, thank you very much have a great time until then thank you very much olivia